Can we read, please, in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6? The book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, it's the last meeting of the ministry section. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance, and supplication for all saints. Now, if you think that we're going to give a very detailed description of the verses that are at hand, you're at the wrong conference. Um, Brethren Dan Shutt and Lindsay uh, Parks are taking up exactly this section in the whole conference in Arlington, Washington this weekend. Uh, What I would like to do, not so much our view all of the... um, or give a great exposition of this portion of Scripture that we have read, but just to notice some of the details in our lives. I am concerned about taking up a word like this at the final section of the ministry this afternoon. And at the same time, there, are, there is a truth before us that we become very aware of as we live the Christian life. And I want to deal this afternoon obviously with the attack of the enemy. And when we come to notice what the Apostle Paul is teaching about the attack of the enemy, we come to understand that there sometimes in our own lives can be confusion about what is happening, frustration about what we're to do, and even self-condemnation after the fact, in what took place in our own lives. When it comes to this expression, obviously, if I want to take up uh, this attack of the enemy, I want to notice something of the armor of God. As we read through our New Testament, there are going to be at least three different occasions where the armor is going to give us a certain aspect. As we read through the book of Romans, we're going to notice that we have the armor of light. When we come to the book of 2 Corinthians, we are going to notice that we have the armor of righteousness. And in fact, when I read through 2 Corinthians in chapter 11, I am going to notice that Satan himself, he will disguise himself as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. And so God is going to supply me with the armor of light to go against the angel of light. And God is going to supply me with the armor of righteousness to go against his ministers of righteousness. And when I come to Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to notice that he gives me the armor of God because now it's not so much that he has masked himself as an angel of light. Now not so much that he's standing, as it were, a righteous person as a minister of righteousness. But in Ephesians chapter 6, what we have is the unmasked enemy in all of his, his personal vileness And the first thing that we want to notice about the enemy is a recognition of the enemy. In the minutes that follow, and I notice that on the schedule, the very last thing it says, please note, all times are approximate. That's a disclaimer I'm beginning to realize is for me. 
the recognition of the enemy. And when we come to these verses, we are going to notice a fourfold description of the enemy that's before us. I want to notice this afternoon just a detail or two of the region of the conflict. Paul is going to tell us something about the reality of our position. And a great part of the uh, portion that we have read together is going to tell us something of the reason for the armor. But before I finish this afternoon, I trust we can get to the readiness for the attack. My brother, my sister, if you and your young Christian life have not yet been under the attack of the enemy, you soon will be. And we look at the believers that are before us today, and some have weathered the attack of that great enemy that we have. The armor of God. Oh, I know that one of the great expositors of a bygone generation would tell us that the armor of light is more for the flesh and the armor of righteousness is for the world and the armor of God is against our enemy, the devil. Well, be that as it may, when we come to this enemy, can I just suggest that he is probably the most powerful of our enemies? The world is probably the most persistent of our enemies. And the flesh is obviously our ever-present enemy. But of the enemies, probably the devil would be the most powerful. So let's come then to the verses that we have read together. I want to notice that in the recognition of the enemy, uh, I hope my brother and my sister are making it clear this afternoon that the enemy is the devil. The enemy is Satan. I was very saddened one day as I received a letter from a sister in the assembly who was very disgruntled about a whole lot of things. And one of the things she said is, I didn't realize that I was going to find my enemy in the assembly. Our enemy is not in the assembly. Unless that's where Satan's seat is. In that place. Not in the assembly. In the city where that assembly was. The enemy is Satan. The recognition of our enemy. It's him. He's a real person. He's a real enemy. And the devil always wants to imitate God and always wants to destroy what is of God. When we come to the verses that we have read together, I want to notice that there is this fourfold description. It says verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Can I just say before I carry on, the devil at times can use human instruments. And sad as it may be the case, he could actually use an instrument that's a Christian. You say, how is that possible? He's a liar. That is his character. He's a liar. Do I ever think that if words were to cross my lips that are not true, I'm acting like the devil? He's a murderer. If I ever am to speak evil of a person so that you also speak evil of that person, gossiping, I'm acting like the devil. The devil has no truth in him. The devil has no right in him. R-I-G-H-T. The devil can only do evil. He's an evil person. And he is our enemy. Back to verse number 12. Against number one principalities, against number two powers, against number three the rulers of darkness of this world, against number four spiritual wickedness in high places. And I just noticed as generally in the scriptures a four would be divided into three and one. The first three words that we have describing for, the, for us, in this case our enemy, they are dealing mostly with his person or his position. And the last word is dealing with his character. So we come to what is principalities, the commencement where he came from, the place that he had, and from there, he's the one 
that is our enemy, the one that we're going to wrestle against, the one that has principalities, the one that has powers, the one that has the ability and a certain control and authority. And then when we come to the rulers of darkness, he is the one that has that crown, that he can, he can actually manipulate. He, he's the person that can uh, uh, give instruction, to give commands. He's the ruler of the darkness. But the fourth expression, spiritual wickedness, that is the characteristic of what he creates. The spiritual wickedness in high places. When we come to the very first part of the book of Ephesians, you and I are in high places. And when we come to chapter 6, we're going to notice that there's an enemy there. And when that enemy has seen that you and I are in that position, he says, that is where God has placed them, and that is where I'm going to fight them. I want to take them down. I want to destroy what God has done. And so he's the enemy that comes on the attack. Can I suggest that when it comes to our enemies, really... In relation to the flesh, I'm on the offensive. Mortify therefore the deeds of the flesh. I'm on the offensive. When it comes to the world, I'm probably going to be on the offensive and the defensive. That is that there are going to times, there are going to be times when I am going to be proactive against the world in relation to its affecting me as a believer. And there are times when I'm going to defend. But when it comes to the devil, don't worry about whether you have to go and attack him. He's coming at you. This is defense. One of the reasons we come to the defense we're going to notice are the words stand and withstand when we get there. But so this enemy is coming and he's going to attack us. It could be that this afternoon I am speaking to someone and you are feeling the reality of Satan's attack on you right now. Maybe you come from a home where there's absolutely no one else that's a believer, nor that has any interest in the things of God, and you feel that you are ostracized for being a Christian. Maybe in your workplace, you're feeling that you are being attacked because you are a Christian. Maybe in your school, you're finding it so difficult to stand as a testimony for the Lord Jesus, because it just seems that every day things are getting worse in their gossiping about you, in their attacks on your person. This afternoon, I want to come to this, that God has provided us with an armor, and it is the armor of God. Can I just say that when it comes to our armor, sometimes we think we're pretty good at making our own armor. It won't work. We can't do it by ourselves, much less in the flesh. And so God has provided us with this armor. I want to suggest something about the region of the conflict. It says uh, uh, spiritual wickedness in high places. You and I are on the earth. We're, we're here. And I I'm going back to what we heard last evening about the world. You see, if we have our focus right here on the, on the earth and in the world, we tend to forget we tend to lose our focus about where God has placed us, where we are, in a position of being spiritually blessed. And so the region of our conflict, while we are on the earth, there is a power, the power of the devil himself, that is seeking to destroy our testimony for God as we live here in the world. The reality of the position, you and I, where we live, what we're doing, we sometimes tend to think that we have to stand for what is right and we have to do what is true and so on. And at times we cause our own conflicts. The reality of our position is that we have the protection of God. God has given us his armor. But as you and I are living in this world, let's not forget that we could win the fight and lose the war. If we are thinking of trying to do it ourselves, and doing what is right, 
the teachers have called us in because our child has caused a disturbance in his class. It's grade two, three, or four, and the teacher said, you've got to come in. And so you come in and you say, well, we've got a problem because your son has made it very clear to the rest of his classmates that he doesn't believe in Santa Claus because Santa Claus doesn't exist. And uh, the rest of our children believe in Santa Claus, so you're going to have to do something about it. And we stand on our guard. We say Santa Claus doesn't exist. Sounds like we're the three-year-old child. (laughs) We're going to win this fight. Maybe we do. Maybe we win the fight. But we lost the war. Because now next year, before we ever get to school, there's a great big sign on every classroom that there'll be no discussion about Santa Claus, there'll be no discussion about Bible, there'll be no discussion about anything, and they closed our mouths completely. And we thought we were winning the fight, but we lost the war. I'm just using one simple illustration of something that can go on in our lives, and you take it where you are, what you're doing. And Satan, he's not so much worried about Santa Claus. But all he wants is for the rest of those people to hate you because you're a Christian. And if they hate you, they're not going to be interested in the gospel that you preach. And then he has won another soul for a lost eternity. And so when we come to the position, uh, the reality of this position, we are standing where Satan will attack us. We are are in a place where we need to be alert as to his attack. Can I just suggest something then about the armor as we go over the reason for the armor? The the Apostle Paul is sitting in a prison cell. Possibly, it's not so much a, a cell where he's confined by himself, but possibly chained to a Roman soldier. And... He has observed that Roman soldier. He has looked at that person and he knows there's a soul inside that body, inside that armor. And the Apostle Paul's heart goes out to that man and and most likely he's shared the gospel with that soldier. And as he sits there and he can hardly, the soldier can hardly wait for the hour to finish. There's time to be up so that he can take off the chain and put another soldier in his place. He's tired of hearing this man. He's tired of hearing about the love of God. And he's tired about hearing uh, of his own wickedness when he's an upright citizen. He's a Roman soldier. But the Apostle Paul is observing him. And as he looks at the armor, the Spirit of God inspires him to begin to write. And one soldier leaves and another soldier comes. And the Apostle's The Apostle Paul's heart is to share the gospel with that man. While he's there, the Apostle Paul sees that there is an attack of the devil. And I just wonder, sometimes, was it one of our brethren this afternoon was saying about Paul, he was such a great man. Sometimes Paul was so concerned and, in fact, so worried about things that he almost became depressed. And so here, we see that he's He's looking at the soldier and he says, I'm going to write something down here because the Spirit of God inspired him to write about the armor. That was Roman armor. He said, God has armor. This is what the Roman armor looks like. He says, I can see that. And so he describes it to us. For you and I to see, as it were, with our own eyes. And as I'm reading through these verses, I can almost see that Roman soldier standing there. And Paul says, the devil's coming to attack. He will come to attack us. Let's see then. When I come to the armor, I am going to suggest very carefully, well knowing that some of my brethren might come afterwards and correct me. But I am going to suggest that there are six items of armor in this section. I want to notice that there are six mentions of a part of the body. And so there is the relationship between the armor and the part of the body and the spiritual lesson that we can learn. 
So when I come to read the verses again, uh, I'm now down to verse number 14. And we're going to notice, first of all, that he's going to mention the loins. The part of your body where there's going to be the belt. That belt is going to be something of a protection for your back, for your hips to carry a heavy load. And obviously the belt in the, in the Roman soldier was going to be something that would gather up a garment for him to be able to run, for him to be able to fight, and at least for him to be able to stand. So the first part of the body that he mentions are the loins. Secondly, uh, while uh, you're going to say this isn't the body part that's mentioned, I'm going to say the heart, because he's going to speak about the breastplate. And so he's going to cover vital organs. I'm not a doctor. There are too many doctors here for me to be talking about medical issues. But the breastplate that's going to cover vital organs. So he's going to deal with the loins. He's going to deal with the heart. The next thing that we have mentioned here are the feet. And so now we're moving from the hips down to the ground. He mentions your feet. Fourthly, he's going to mention, I'm going to suggest the arm because the Roman soldier had the shield strapped to his arm that shield was going to protect not only his arm not only the shoulder was going to protect probably his whole body but when we get to the mention of a uh, one of the body parts the next thing we're going to notice is the head obviously because he's going to speak of the helmet of salvation and obviously implied in the last expression, take the sword of the Spirit, he's going to talk about the hand. So he's dealing with us head to foot. He's dealing with our loins. He's dealing with our heart, with our feet, with our arm, with our head, and with our hands. And so that is the first list of the articles that are, uh, I'm going to bring to our attention as far as the armor is concerned. But obviously, uh, my purpose this afternoon is the... Um, the reason for the armor obviously is protection. The reason that God gives us this armor is not to leave us alone against the attack of the enemy. The reason for the armor is so that I might be protected. And so first of all, when it comes to the loins, he is going to give us a belt. And this wasn't just, you know, the uh, ones that you find in Walmart on the sale rack for five dollars. This was a belt that was a thick leather belt. It was made for war. It was a piece of armor. It was for protection. It was to make the, the to be the most helpful to the soldier that was wearing it. And so it's going to be a wide belt. Uh, in fact, in this country I believe that if you were going to go to a store something like Home Depot, maybe Lowe's, Oh, Menards, that's it. Menards, that's where you go in this country. Menards, yeah. And the people that are working in the back, they're all wearing a harness, a big wide belt. And they're using that because they're going to be lifting boxes, lifting boxes that weigh at least half a pound. So they're going to be lifting those boxes. And they need that protection because Home Depot doesn't want to be sued because of back problems years later. But it's a belt that is going to be for their protection and their activity. Next we come to the breastplate. It was made of metal, something similar to scales that moved back and forth so that as the soldier moves, it was not just an armor that was solid because this person is going to be under attack and for that reason he is going to uh, enter into combat. He's going to move. And so the breastplate that's going to cover probably from about the neck down to the waist. The next thing we're going to have is boots. That's a good thing for today, boots. Lots of snow outside. Don't be slipping on the ice. These aren't going to be just some little strappy sandals. I better just leave that where it is. On the airplane on the way here, I read that the average American woman has 27 pairs of shoes. Probably half of those are sandals, if they call those shoes. 
This is a soldier that's in the battlefield. This is a soldier that's going to be, that's going to be standing on rough terrain. This is a soldier that's ready for an attack. They are shoes that have a thick sole, that have a protective cover, that have straps that are wrapped around his leg for his protection. Then we're going to have, obviously, the helmet that is going to protect the head. I've got to uh, carry on because I want to get to what is the, the meaning uh, of these pieces of, uh, of equipment, the armor that we have. Obviously, the sword. A sword that is going to be used for combat. A sword that is going to be moved by his hand. He doesn't have this armor just to stand there and be attacked. He has the armor to use it. And so when we come to these pieces of armor, I do want to come just to their, uh, the, the, the um, relationship they have to the very spiritual truths that Paul is bringing out here. So this belt, it's going to be the belt of truth. My brother, my sister, as human beings, in the world that we live in, and things that our brethren have mentioned in this conference already, humanism, things that they have, are telling us that the world is, how the world is trying to influence us, do you know that human beings have become experts at not telling lies, but not telling the truth? This belt is truth. And if you don't tell the truth, there's absolutely no value in anything you say. Nothing. This belt is truth. My brother, my sister, if we want to combat the attack of the devil it's going to be with truth do you know the good thing about truth you don't have to remember what you said you told the truth and in our lives I can tell you this that attack from the devil he's going to come and he's going to want to make you lie and let me tell you once he makes you lie he is going to run straight to the throne of God and accuse you before God himself saying look that man calls himself a Christian and he lied wonderful that we have a savior an advocate with the father that just raises a nail printed hand you and I without even having confessed it yet the Lord Jesus in heaven he says he's forgiven but the devil will come to attack and we need to have on the belt of truth secondly the breastplate of righteousness my brother my sister this righteousness is the conduct of our lives, the acts that we commit. Righteousness. Brother Sharp was telling about the neighbors what they think of us. or saying they're watching us. I wonder if they see righteous acts in our lives. When they describe us together, you say, boy, I sure don't like that neighbor. He does everything right. Uh, I sure wish that I could, uh, I could get rid of that, uh, uh, sitting beside that girl in school because she won't let me cheat. Righteous acts in our life. There's a breastplate. And vital as it is to our Christian life. Righteous acts. Not only truthful words that come out of our mouth. Righteous acts. As we live our lives. The boots. The gospel. How active are we in the gospel? Uh, I, I want to bring another application in here. But I just want to say this. How active are we in the gospel? When's the last time I gave out a gospel tract? When's the last time that I had enough courage to speak to someone about the gospel? When's the last time that I was courageous enough to live the gospel before somebody? The commitment and courage to get out there and do the gospel. Can I suggest to you, my young brother, my young sister, when you feel that there's a possibility of temptation coming your way, use the gospel, please use the gospel. And when any of us face temptation in our lives, let's use the gospel. Because the gospel is the truth of the word of God. And when this world tries to trip us up because we're Christians and will try to lead us and tempt us into sin, use the gospel. Walk the gospel. Live a life that's worthy of the gospel. And so our shoes, 
are going to help us against the attack of the devil. Not only our shoes, but we come now to the arm, the shield, the shield of faith. This isn't just a matter of saying, well, I'm saved and then uh, the word of God is true. The shield of faith. I believe God. God can help me in my attack against the devil. Do I believe it? I believe it. God can help me. And I believe what God's word says. And so the shield of faith is to stop the fiery darts of the, of the wicked one. And you know, the devil has next to won the battle when it comes to this. That he comes at us with a dart and we say, well, I'm just not sure. I don't know. And the shield of faith is hanging at our side. And we leave ourselves wide open to the temptation. I believe God is what the apostle Paul said. Acts chapter 27. I believe God. And do I live that out in my life? By the shield of faith. And when the world tells me something else, I believe God. And when temptation comes to me, I believe God. I'm going to use the shield of faith because it's going to be a protection for my whole body. I'm going to move my arm. I'm going to see, in my alertness, I'm going to see that the dart of the devil is coming. And I believe God. And so I'm going to use my shield. Then he says, the helmet of salvation. I don't remember, I, I haven't counted how many young people in the last number of months in the country of Mexico have come and their major struggle, thoughts. That I'm not doubting God, but I just wonder if the Bible is, uh, I'm saved, but I'm really thinking that this idea that the mind Oh, if only we would put on the helmet of salvation. This is not the salvation of the soul. It's on your head. This is the salvation of your mind. I believe God, the shield of faith, yes, but I need to protect my mind. So the devil can't just put any little thought in there. The devil can't come into us and live inside of us, but he can put a thought in our head. And so I need the helmet of salvation to protect my mind from the attack of this enemy, the devil, Satan. The last one, the sword of the Spirit. Again, I suppose that as children, when we read the sword of the Spirit, we just thought, well, that's the Bible. And so we went around uh, whipping everybody on the head with Bibles, thinking that that was the sword of the Spirit. We thought we were playing really... Righteous games. That's not what the word of God means here. The sword of the spirit. I'm under the attack of the devil. And I have every one of the pieces of armor in place. But he's still coming. And when he realized that the dart he aimed at me was stopped by the shield, he's still coming. And I'm going to need to use the sword. I'm going to need to use it. And for the very situation I'm in, the Holy Spirit of God will bring to me the word of God that I need for that situation. Not just taking my Bible and say, oh, well, the Bible says, so that's okay. No, no. It's the word of God for that situation. The temptation that I'm in. The situation that I'm faced with the enemy that's coming at me and the Spirit of God is going to give it to me right there. I need to put into practice the use of these tools. My time's up and I'm not finished. Um, what else is new? Um, I just want to say something about readiness for the attack. There are four verbs that I, I want to bring to our attention in relation to our readiness for the attack. First of all, he says, be strong. Secondly, he says, put on. Thirdly, he says, stand. And then he says, withstand. I, I want to just make a distinction between those two words. And then he says, pray. Now, the armor of God are the articles we've mentioned. But the use of those articles are our responsibility. And so he says, be strong. Do you know, I've got a word written down here that I don't like. I'm going to use it anyway because it begins with E and so I'll do all my other words. 
Exercise. That's what it means. Be strong. Be making yourself stronger and stronger. That's the idea. Be strong. Finally, my brother, be strong. I'm going to have to exercise to be able to win against the attack of the devil. Exercise. But then he says, put on. Equip. God has actually equipped us, and it's not just a matter of going and finding the equipment. It's a matter of just taking what God has given and putting it on. That's the idea. Put on to equip ourselves. The equipment is there. God has given it to us. I'll tell you, what a foolish man would I be if I left this conference this afternoon and out on the street I was attacked by the devil and I decided, well, I don't know what to do. God has given me the equipment. He just wants me to put it on. Could it be that I, as a Christian, am just too lazy even to pick up the equipment? And put it on. Oh, the Apostle Paul, he wants us to know that God has provided this for us. The third thing, quickly. Stand. He uses that word twice. And then he says, withstand. The, the, the exhortation to stand is in verse number 14. Stand, therefore. But in the verse previous, he says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand. Here our Bible says, withstand. When James writes this word, he says, resist the devil. To stand. Boy, I was embarrassed in high school and my feet started to grow so big and I had to wear size 12 shoes. My mom said, don't you worry about that. You've got a good understanding. <laughs> the idea is that we're standing. To stand and withstand, it's not so much now offensive. We're standing our ground. And the devil's coming, and we're not going to go back. We're not going to turn and run. We're going to stand, and we're going to whisk, and we're going to resist the devil that's coming at us. Why? Because we've got the armor of God on. And so that is the enemy that we're facing. We're, we're withstanding because of the enemy that is there, to withstand, to resist. And then finally, he says to pray. What's that? That's our energy. The energy that we get from it. That's not one of the pieces of armor. That is what we do as an exercise. We pray. Or we pray. Pray. Before James says to resist the devil, he says, draw nigh to God. And so I'm going to use the same illustration that our brother David used this afternoon. To be this close to God. That will help us put on the armor. That will help us withstand the, the attack. That will help us to win over our enemy. Oh, may the Lord help us. As we face a world that's cruel, as we face a flesh that's vile, but as we face an enemy that's powerful, as he attacks us, may the Lord help us to stand against the enemy that we might glorify the name of the Lord Jesus.